structure that goes all the way through versus structure that is not. We need to be able to fill apart displaced versus no displaced. Okay, so in non displaced, ends of the bone, bone remain in the perfect alignment and displaced fracture. Uh, they are all the uh, simple, sorry, simple versus compound or cold fracture. So this is the penetration of the skin. Okay. In compound, there is penetration of the skin. In simple, there is no penetration. So, uh, what kind of question you can expect? I describe a fracture, and you give the correct description of uh, complete non displaced. Okay, something like that. We clear. Now, uh, stages of the fracture healing, very sort of uh, uh, bullet point like. So, you've got. So once the bone is fractured, the first thing that forms is this hematoma. So basically a bunch of clotted blood. And then fibroblasts start to produce connective tissue that joins the ends of the bone. And chondroblasts start to produce um, cartilage. So, connective tissue and cartilage produced by fibroblasts and chondroblasts, uh, respectively, forms fibrocartilaginous caps. Eventually, this fibrocartilaginous callus, the matrix of connective tissue and cartilage that connects the broken bones, is replaced with a spongy bone, and that forms bony bones. Now, it's really important to understand one key thing. So then bone is healed. So when, look, when you have two ends of the bone connected by the bony callus, this bony callus is a spongy bone. Okay. If you remember that on the outside of the bone, on the outside of the bone, it's a compound. So, this perfect structure is formed because this bony palace undergoes remodeling, and it undergoes remodeling because your bone that is almost healed, it experiences the same mechanical stress as it did before the trauma. Does that make sense? So at some point, when bony palace is formed successfully, you start using your, for instance, structure forearm in the same way, of course, not as intense, but mechanical stressors basically repeat themselves. That ensures the bone modeling that leads to complete healing, and it you know, forms the same bone structures as before the fracture. Good? Now, sort of true uh, bone problems, okay? And this is the trauma, right? What about not? So we've got three main diseases. First is Pajet's disease. Basically, I see it as a haphazard accumulation of the bone and electron nodes, but basically much more spongy bone is formed 
than needed. So you have um, increased ratio of spongy bone versus non-spongy uh, Most common locations for this are head and hips. And the underlying mechanism is currently unknown. Most likely it's genetic. Good. I mean, I don't really have it. Okay, so that's good. Second condition is osteomalacia slash rickets. Okay, so what is that? Decreased calcium content. Okay. Now, what's the difference between osteomalacia and rickets? Osteomalacia is the term that's used for adults. Rickets is the term that's used for kids. That's it. It's all different. That make sense? What can lead to decrease deposition of calcium in the bones? Low calcium in the diet or low vitamin. Does that make sense? Because vitamin D is essential for retrieving calcium from, from the bone. Um, your diet, if you don't follow any crazy stuff, is going to low calcium, 100%. Uh, regarding vitamin D, just noting my wife's uh, physician, she said that she recommends that everyone who lives in Ohio takes vitamin D. Probably the British still have them inside. Because if vitamin D is produced in the skin, it is exposed to the sun, and we're not going to go around naked if we're going to say that. Finally, probably the biggest problem in the world osteoporosis. This is the condition, very quite, kind of complicated condition, in which Activity of osteoclasts dominates over activity of osteoblasts. So, bone resorption happens faster than the bone deposition. Does that make sense? Now, that can be, of course, can be resolved. Various hormonal abnormalities. I'm not going to, like, hormonal, I mean, like, uh, overproduction of parathyroid hormones, parathyroid tumor. Those are pretty rare, so I'm going to uh, relate this to the age related changes. So, with age, production of estrogen and testosterone. Decreases. Okay, so in females, lower estrogen, males lower testosterone. However, if you would look at the graph of testosterone production in males, the decline is pretty smooth. In females, there is a pretty large draw immediately after the menopause when um, ovaries produce much much less estrogen than they did before. Does that make sense? So the first risk factor for developing osteoporosis is female sex. Uh, it's much more pronounced in Caucasians. Um, small body. Now, sorry, I don't know how to say proper language, but like being small, that's it. Okay, like there are some people who are smaller, people who are big. There's being small, drinking, and smoking. 
and sitting here in that time. People who don't exercise. Okay? That make sense? The result of all of this are brittle bones, uh, which are easily fractured most frequently. The bones in the hip, I'll address it when we talk about anatomy and spinal cord. Um, hip bones, the grab on. So I talk specifically this, the neck of the hip, neck of the femur. And spinal column, it's called cumulative fractures. When not a column snap, the individual vertebrae just crushed. So they split in pieces and it's really hard to put them all together. Does that make sense? Now, treatment is complicated because we can't do much, especially at this age. There used to be hormone replacement therapy, but it wasn't working that well because there was a lot of side effects such as breast cancer. There are some drugs that mimic estrogen without causing breast cancer. There is a couple of drugs, bifosphonate drugs and denosumab, that either reduce activity of osteoclasts or just destroy them, which is not great, but you know, it helps to offset the detrimental effects. Okay, does that make sense? Best way not to treat but to prevent. In the best prevention of osteoporosis in like beef, because menopause is going to hit every woman. And for males, the risk of osteoporosis increases a lot when they take um, androgen inhibitors like testosterone inhibitors in case of prostate cancer. It's more rare. So we're going to talk about feeding. For women, the best prophylaxis of osteoporosis is calcium rich diet and resistance training. When you do resistance training, bones become thicker and denser. You're basically building a savings account. I mean, osteoporosis is going to happen. The question is how bad and how fast. So if you accumulate enough sort of bone over life, and then menopause starts and you start losing bone density, but you keep exercising, the loss of bone density will be much less pronounced. Does that make sense? And of course, you know, smoking and drinking doesn't help. And interesting enough, what else doesn't help? Soft drinks, like Diet Coke or Fanta, because they are very acidic. And in order to buffer that acid, um, organism has to take phosphate from the bone, which reduces phosphate and calcium, reduces density. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So then we have Benjamin to the rescue. We're going to talk about anatomy, and we'll have to talk right here behind the damn thing to record. Okay. So we're going to review bone anatomy. There will be no writing. I strongly suggest you have these boxes in front of you. They contain skulls. And Feel free to open and pull them out also in the drawers, in the, in the tables. There are scattered bones. It gets stuck uh, sometimes a little bit. And we're just, yeah, just take the out, just take it out. Okay. I have Oh, you will have plenty of time. Don't worry. This stuff, you can take it out, but not right now. We're going to start with the skull and we're going to go from top down. Now, before we start, I want to give you a couple of uh, learning suggestions. Um, if I would ask you right now, where would you start? Like if I would tell you, go and learn skeleton anatomy. Which body part would you start with? Don't overthink. Terrible idea. <laughs> I'll explain why. Because the from learning the most complicated parts, really, are carpals, 
and tarsus. Carpals are the wound. By the time you go head, oh, your skull, vertebral column, thoracic cage, uh, you know, upper limbs, you get to carpals, you're exhausted. You're tired. I suggest when you study, start every study session with a different body part. Start with the arm and then thorax, leg and then vertebral cord. Throw cranium. That's what I see all the time. People know cranium up and down, left and right. When it comes down to limbs, they just, uh, you don't know. Okay, that makes sense? Bit of a downside to the fact that we're moving online is that you won't be able to use models. Exam is based on the pictures you probably saw, those pictures in the study guide. So those photographs that are in the study guide, I promise, they're gonna be on the exam. Am I clear? Exactly the same stuff that is on the study guide will be on the exam. Cool? Paper? Multiple choice. Multiple choice. All of them will be multiple choice. Your anatomy is going to be multiple choice. The only, I would say, the only difference compared to the anatomy exam that you took on paper is that you're going to see instead of seeing 15 pictures with 60 questions, you're going to see 60 pictures for 60 questions. So each question will have its own pick with an arrow and stuff. Clear? So, skeleton can be anatomically divided into axial and appendicular. Axial skeleton is cranium, vertebral column, thoracic cage. Oh, you can throw in something in there. Appendicular skeleton is pectoral girdle and upper limbs, pelvic girdle and lower limbs. There are 206 bones, and I know it sounds very intimidating, but a lot of them are paired bones. Does that make sense? And a lot of them, I don't ask you to, for instance, uh, be able to recognize each individual vertebra or each individual rib in a disarticulated skeleton. Now, the term disarticulated skeleton in relation to our upcoming examples, that the majority of bones will be presented as the individual one. Does that make sense? So I can tell you up front, What's going to be disarticulated and what's not? Pictorial girdle, large bones of the arm will be disarticulated. They will be shown individually. Am I clear? Like you, same is true for lower limbs and pelvic girdle. Pelvic girdle will be disarticulated. Large bones of the leg, like tibial and tibia femur will be disarticulated, so you will see something like that on the corner. So far, I'm making sense. Hands and feet will be in the entirety. So if I ask you to identify certain bones on the hand, I will show you this, this whole thing. Does that make sense? It really helps. Thoracic cage will not be disarticulated. Skull will not be disarticulated. I will show it as a whole. Vertebral uh, column will be disarticulated, but you're not going to study each of 24 vertebrae. It's going to be simple. So far, we're good. Let's start with the cranium. So, in the cranium, we have cranial bones and facial bones. Cranial bones here are pretty intuitive. So we've got frontal bone, in front, and they will repeat to a large extent, not to all, all extent, 
you're going to repeat uh, lobes of the brain. Frontal lobe, frontal, sorry, frontal bone, two parietal bones. This is an occipital bone. Okay. These on the sides here. And here are two oral bones. Okay. And if we remove the calvaria and look inside, it will see two different uh, three depressions. Those are three cranial fossae, anterior or ventral, middle and posterior or dorsal cranial fossae. Those little depressions, and not so little, basically accommodate the brain. Now, if you would look at the middle cranial fossa, middle cerebral fossa right here, you can kind of see that its fossa is shaped as a butterfly or a bat. Now, this bat-shaped arrangement comes from this bone, this bone, okay? So this is a sphenoid bone. That's one of the articulated, disarticulated bones that I can show you. You can see that it does look like a butterfly with some processes that articulate with other bones of the skull, like greater and lesser wings and cerebral processes. Another bone that you can't really see in the arranged skull, you can see Christagali, a little ridge um, right above the nasal cavity, side of attachment for a dura matter of the brain. So this is this bone, okay? This is an ethmoid bone, okay? So this sphenoid and ethmoid bone, the irregular bones, are deep inside of the cranium, okay? In fact, ethmoid bone, this part of the ethmoid bone, forms part of the roof of your nasal cavity. So far, are you folding more or less? Now let's switch to some projections and some other elements of this spot. Um, if you would look at the bottom of the skull here, you will notice the large opening which is called foramen magnum. It's the opening through which the spinal cord enters the skull. Does that make sense? And on the sides of the foramen magnum, closer to the front, there are two, um, how to say, very smooth projections. Kind of rub on them. Right here, can you see them? Those are occipital condyles. Occipital condyles articulate, if you look at Benjamin, you kind of see occipital condyles articulate in the first cervical vertebra. And thanks to that articulation, we can say yes. Okay. Now, on the sides, you can see a couple of processes, uh, bony projections on the temporal bone. If you look pretty close to the temporal mandibular joint, you can see this large, blunt projection right here. This is the mastoid process, site of attachment to sternocleidomastoid muscle, which turns your head left and right. You can actually see this muscle if you turn your head like this. That's the sternocleidomastoid, and it gets and gets attached. You can basically follow it up and feel the mastoid process to which it attached right up behind your ear. 
okay? Uh, a little bit behind the, the lower jaw, you can see a really, really sharp process. Can you see that? Like really sharp process, it's called styloid process. It's the site of attachment for several muscles that control movements of your pharynx of your throat. For instance, still a hyoid. And will control processes like swallowing or speech. Okay. And you know, it's not really a hole on the model, but here you can see acoustic meters. That's the opening in the temporal bone. That's that's this one. When you stick a finger in your ear, that's that. That's the one. Okay, good. Let's take a look at the facial bones. Nasal. Two nasal bones. They form the bridge of the nose. The cheekbones here. Those are zygomatic bones. Now, if you look at the side of the nose, at the basically at the corner of the eye, you can see the bone with a little opening that goes downwards. Okay, it's right here. Um, I'm trying to see if I have a reasonably sharp objects. I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I'll try to use this one. So here. That's lacrimal bone. It's really small and it contains lacrimal duct. It drains tears from your eyes into your nasal cavity. Um, and if you look inside of the nose, nasal cavity, you may notice a blood shaped bone at the bottom called vomer. Okay. And vomer together with perpendicular plate from a thmoid bone. If you look like this, like straight in there, vomer is at the bottom, perpendicular plate is at the top. Okay? They form part of a nasal septum, the structure that separates your nose into two nostrils. On the sides of your nasal cavity, the bottom, you can see a couple of bones that look like folds. Those are inferior nasal concha. They essentially increase the surface area inside of the nasal cavity. These bones here, that's the maxillary bone. Upper jaw, it's two bones used together. This is the only movable bone in the skull. Uh, mandible. Okay. And interestingly enough, if we would look here from that perspective, you will see the bony palate, the heart palate, and the back part of the heart palate is a relatively small bone called palatine bone. So your heart palate is palatine bone in the back and maxillary bone in the front. Okay. <clears throat> now I wanted to highlight there is an optic canal in the corner of the orbit, a smaller opening. That's where the um, optic nerve goes through. Yeah, I think we're more or less for the purpose of our review, we're more or less done with the skull. I'm going to move on to vertebral column. For that, I need to still Okay. 
So, <clears throat> what about columns in a vertebral column? So, a vertebral column consists of 24 vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, and 5 lumbar. At the bottom, it articulates. Let me try and see if I can. The bottom it articulates with the sacrum, okay? And sacrum extends with that tailbone named pocket. We're going to get to the sacrum later. Let's talk about a garden variety a vertebrae. So, vertebrae typically supports the body of the vertebrae, that's the main carrying structure, right? Vertebral foramen, opening through which spinal cord goes through. Spinous process, transverse processes, superior and inferior. So superior and inferior articulate processes as well. Now, this structure, it goes like, that, that is called vertebral arch. If you will take two vertebrae and put them next to each other, you will see that there are openings between them. I'm sticking my fingers a lot of them here. This opening is called intervertebral foramen. So, spinal nerves, they project through intervertebral frame. You must be able to distinguish five different types of vertebrae based on the structure. First one is first cervical vertebrae, also known as atlas. Okay? Atlas supports the skull right here, okay? And it does not have a body. Look at this. It doesn't have a body. It has what's called lateral masses. And these lateral masses, your occipital, occipital condyles are sliding on. And you're saying this. Second cervical vertebrae, called axis, shows this process on top of it. This process is called dent. And it is essentially a missing body of the first cervical vertebrae. Uh, I can't really do it here, like right here, but just basically trust me. There is a ligament called annular ligament that goes around dense and enables your first cervical vertebrae to rotate left and right. Exactly. Based due to the axis, second cervical, you can say no. Atlas, yes. Axis, no. Other cervical vertebrae, C3, C7, they look fairly the same. And if you look at them, they all are first relatively small and light. The body is not huge. See that? The body is not really big. And you can easily identify cervical vertebrae by the presence of these openings called transverse foramen which are found exclusively in cervical vertebrae. The uh, accessory nerve, the cranial nerve number 12, for example, goes through this transverse frame. Okay, so far, another uh, couple of distinctive features. You look at the cervical vertebrae, it has a bifid spinous process and triangular 
vertebral foramen. Thoracic vertebrae is usually what is used to illustrate, like Wikipedia article on vertebrae, that would probably be the first. Body is more massive. Vertebral foramina is round. Spinous process is really well defined and it moves downwards. Transverse processes are well defined either. The structure of the superior and inferior articulate processes is such that you can slightly rotate your vertebral column in the thoracic region. So far we're good. Lastly, lumbar vertebra. It's huge. From the side, by the way, looks like a loose head. Okay, it has a massive body, triangular vertebral foramen. Its spinous process looks like a hatchet and pointed horizontally. And it's superior and inferior articulate processes are constructed in a way so that your lumbar portion of your spinal column is locked. You can't really rotate anything there. Okay. Now, last couple of bits. Oh, essentially one. Two. Of the axial skeleton, well, not last bit of axial, last bit of spinal cord on the sacrum. Sacrum consists of five vertebrae that are fused. Uh, it articulates with the fifth lumbar vertebrae, and articulates mean contacts with fifth lumbar vertebrae at uh, the base of the sacrum. There is a sacral canal. An opening that accommodates cauda equina, those extended and filum terminali. Filum terminali is an anatomical structure that holds your spinal cord, and cauda equina is what your spinal cord is branches into. The openings here, called uh, sacral foramina, allow sacral spinal nerves to get out to wherever they inner it. Okay. Now these surfaces here and here are surfaces that form sacroiliac joint, joint between two two bones on the side. Now the back is really not useful just to get that. There's a muscle called oxygen that is attached to it. Ribs. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. I can't find fight the temptation of saying that the rest of the world is the same as the ribs. I was asked this before. Uh, 12 on each side, so 12 pairs. Ribs from one to seven, these ones are called shoe ribs. Another term for them is vertebral sternum. The head of these ribs articulates with the vertebrae, and the shaft articulates with the sternum. So far, are you following? Group number eight, nine, and ten are first three false ribs, and sometimes they're referred as vertebral chondra because the hands articulate with the vertebrae while the shafts articulate not with the bone but with a cartilage. You know, we can say that's cartilage too, but this cartilage is disconnected to the bone. This cartilage is connected to the cartilage. More These two bottom ribs, 11 and 12, are also false. They are sometimes called floating or vertebral ribs. Does that make sense? You should be able to identify those ribs on the 
briefcage. Photograph of briefcage. It's not going to be distributed to work. Clear so far? Good. Sternum. Um, consists of three parts one nubrium, body of sternum, xiphoid process. Any questions? That's your axial scan. Now we're going to switch to appendicular skeleton. Let me go some more. So, um, superior part of appendicular skeleton. This one. Maybe we have more than I need. So, superior part of the appendicular skeleton, you have pectoral girdle. Pectoral girdle consists of two clavicles and two scapulae. Basically, clavicles and scapulae embrace your upper arms and put them in a forward position. Clavicle, here we go. Clavicle articulates with the sternum, and the sternal end of the clavicle is blunt. Another flat end articulates here with the scapula with acromial process of scapula. Uh, it's called acromial process, so the end is referred to as acromial. Sternal end of the clavicle and the acromial end of the clavicle. Does that make sense? Scapula here forms a um, glenoid, uh, glenohumeral joint or shoulder joint. And when you look at the individual scapula, you can identify certain very specific parts. First is a spine, okay, which kind of marks the posterior, the ventral aspect of the body. Spine divides posterior surface of the scapula into supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. Fossa is the shallow depression. The anterior surface of the scapula that articulates with the rib cage is one big subscapular fossa. And you can clearly see two massive um, processes. The acromial process, which is posterior, and coracoid process, which is anterior. These processes are sites of attachment for muscles of the trunk and muscles on the upper arm. That's why they so project. Okay? This part of the scapula is called glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity articulates, I just have to do this here. Glenoid cavity articulates the head of the humerus. You can clearly see this articulation on that scale. And the questions of the scapula and clavicles. Well, I'm going to add one more thing. By looking at the scapula, you can easily say if it's right or left. Okay? Look at this and say yourself, okay, that is spine. Spine is in the back. So I'm looking at the back. And this is glenoid cavity. So the arm should be attached here. So if it's back, and the arm is hanging here. This is the right arm, so that's the right scapula. Arm. Um, mostly long bones. Um, long bones and arm are very simple. Upper one is humerus, the head of the humerus, articulation of the glenoid cavity, and two tubercles, the greater and the lesser, and the side of attachment for. Uh, multiples, multiple muscles of the upper uh, upper arm and, and, and forearm. 
the distal end, you can see several uh, very, very easily identifiable structures. First is this depression, which is called trochlea. Trochlea from Greek means a pulley. So what essentially happens in the elbow? The trochlea of the humerus articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. It would look something like that. Can you see that? On the same trochlea, you can see a couple of depressions. One of them is here. This depression is coronoid fossa. And coronoid process of ulna, the forearm bone, goes into that depression. Depression on the back is called olecranon fossa. And olecranon process of ulna goes into that depression in the back. Does that make sense so far? This um, round enlargement is called capitulum. So this is the capitulum. It articulates with the radius. The lateral bone in the forearm, we'll get back to those in a second. And this projection, see that? This is called a medial epicondyle. It's a pretty significant projection. Muscles that flex your wrists um, and wrist and fingers are attached to that projection, okay? I, we had a family experience with it. My son uh, fractured it away, so it was completely separated from the elbow. And the physician said that, that they needed to do the surgery right away because he showed me pictures. He was still, he could still kind of move his fingers and wrist, and every time he moved it, Muscles basically pull that bone fragment farther and farther away from the humerus. So they had to squip, like literally screw it in back, put it on the side. Bones of the forearm. Lateral radius, so it will be here. And medial ulna, so that will be here. Okay. Now, it's interesting how they are arranged in terms of where the head of the radius is. This is the head of the radius, right here, in the elbow. But this is the head of the ulna. Okay, so they are kind of anti parallel I already mentioned that ulna has this structures. This is how you can tell. You see U, the letter U, ulna. Uh, coronoid process, olecranon process, trochlear notch here. That brings us to the hand. So hand contains both the easiest and the hardest bones to remember. The easiest ones are metacarpals, and phalanges. So these five bones, bones that form your palm, are metacarpals. They all are metacarpals that differ only by a number. One, two, three, four, five. You start counting from the thumb, then you go all the way to the foot. Okay? Same rule of enumeration applies for Phalanges, there are 14 of them. Um, on four digits from uh, index finger to middle to ring to pinky here, there are three, three phalanges. Proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. So basically you have here proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. The thumb, okay, pollux, there's only two, proximal, 
and distal. Does that make sense to you? Just two phalanges. So now we go, help us God, Arcus. There are eight of them, and they are loosely organized. I'm going to stick it as close to the camera as possible. They are loosely organized into two layers. Okay. Yeah, you should have you should have a hand. I'm trying to find something. Sorry. So, um, I'm going to start with, I think you have, your thumb is lost, maybe. There are out there. So let's take a look. Now, first, I want to show you where I usually start the identification. So you can find the thumb, right? And you can find here a couple of bones. One is immediately proximal to the thumb, and one is slightly more proximal. See that bone here that I'm tapping on? It's next to the radius. It is somewhat a bean-shaped bone. Can you see that? So this bean-shaped bone is scaphoid. And if you will put Benjamin into anatomical position, trying to keep out. This, this is where scaphoid is. <coughs> It's going to be here. When we start naming bones, starting at scaphoid. So look, scaphoid. Then there is a bone called lunate. Next bone is called trichmetrum. And this small bone right here that I'm stroking with my fingers. It's called PC4. Now we go back to the thumb and we start the next row. Right under the thumb is trapezium. Then under the metacarpal 2 is trapezoid. Metacarpal 3. Capitate, and finally metacarpal four, amati. Okay. So I'm going to go now, kind of you know, without pauses. Scaphoid, lunati, trichotron, pisiform, trapezium. Trapezoid, trapezoid, capitati, amati. There's a mnemonic rule that you can use. That's actually, I'm going to put it on the board. So, first of all, what I usually suggest is pretty schematic, okay? So, that's your fingers, okay? So that's thumb, index, middle, ring, finger. And these are 
particles. Okay. So scaphoid chromatic depression of cruciform, trapezium trapezoid, but the pattern will come off. It's more or less schematic, but I look, you start here, you start at scaphoid, and you go this direction, and then you move back in this direction. So S L to P to P to the mnemonic rule, which is really hard to get out of your head once you hear it. Mm -hmm. Some lovers, yes, some lovers try positions that they cannot handle. Okay? You remember it after the first try. It's so stupid. So, this is one of the things, like, when you start working, like, if I ask you to identify a particular bow, it's good to have on in the hand, it's good to have kind of, you know, a starting point, if you know what I mean. For instance, look, if you know to start at scaffold, you know, you know for instance, you know, trape uh, trapezo uh, trapezium is right under the thumb. Trapezoid is right under the ring finger, okay? Oh, second metaphor. Papirati looks like a Darth Vader head, Darth Vader's head, and it's right under the middle finger, and Amari is in the front. Okay. So if you know this little uh, reference points, then it becomes a little bit tedious, but very doable. We good so far? Okay. Now let's talk about building verbal. So, tell this. Let me grab this. Oh, it's not this. The pelvis consists of two coxal bones, like this, and second. So what I want you to know about coxal bones. Coxal bone is the result of fusion of three bones. The upper part is called ilium, that's what you can tap on when you tap on the sides. This front part is called pubis. We try to elevate the gentleman in the middle. Let's hope it, it's going to work in the front and slide over the middle. So you see this? That's pubis, two pubic parts. The books of bones are connected by the pubic symphysis, the cartilage, fiber cartilage, allows some flexibility. Uh, and then in the back, back part, but you can feel like if you if you land on your butt really really hard, and it really hurts against the bones, that's ischia. So ischial tuberosity here, the site of attachment or muscles of the posterior leg, as well as this ischial spine. This depression, called greater sciatic notch, um, that's where the sciatic nerve, for example, goes under or in, call it whatever you want. This opening is called obturator foramen, a whole bunch of blood vessels like obturator artery and nerves, like obturator nerve, they go through the obturator frame. Okay. 
This is Iliad Crest. And that's the site of attachment for pretty strong core muscles, like external and internal obliques. Okay, so far so good. This depression is called the acetabulum. And the acetabulum, um, that's actually, let's see. no, that's not right. Because this, okay, this is, no, that's the right hip bone, this one. You can tell by the position of acetabulum and the um, articulate surface that forms sacroiliac joint here. And this is the left femur. Okay, so that's right and left, they don't match, which is fine. So let's, we kind of smoothly transitioned from the hips to the leg. Humor, the longest, the strongest bone in the human body. Uh, head of the femur articulates to the acetabulum of the boxel bone. It is positioned in the neck. And in the context of osteoporosis, neck of the femur is one of the most frequently fractured parts, frequently fractured locations in elderly folks with osteoporosis. Now, this distal end, end of the femur articulates the bone and tibia. So, condyles, the femur, articulate with condyles of tibia. And you can see this in the condylar fossa. Okay, and you can see in the condylar process here. Okay, that's how they articulate. And you have medial and lateral epicondyles site of attachment for various muscles. <coughs> now, in regards to tibia, that's the only weight carrying bone in the lower leg. <coughs> Despite the fact that lower leg has two bones, all your body weight is projected on the tibia. You see how massive it is. Fibula is much thinner, smaller. <clears throat> and there are examples when people will fracture fibula, you can still walk around because it's not a weight bearing bone. How do you fracture? This one, yeah. um, that's a great question. It's called Oats Fracture. When you do a version of the foot, um, I can't really show because I can't levitate. Yeah. But imagine for a second that this, this are feet, okay? So if you go like this, your foot goes like this. Uh, so you kind of keep your foot sideways uh, and I will try to show. So your foot turns this way and fractures lateral um, malleoles. And fractures lateral malleoles. And it kind of fractures here. That's the port fracture. It's interesting if it's really strong diversion. That's old real question. If it's really strong diversion, not only fibula can fracture, but also since you see medial malleoles on the tibia, this projection, there's there are some really, really strong ligaments there. The ligaments are so strong that that motion can fracture the malleoles. So it can be fractured bone here and detached malleoles here. Does that make sense? That's how you do it. Um, my sister-in-law fractured her fibula by sliding on the ice, just falling, you know, she was unlucky. One of my buddies accidentally stepped into a hole in the ground, 
fell, and he was walking around, like he was walking after them. It was hurting, but he was walking. And finally, bones of the foot. <clears throat> so let's get this simple stuff out. You see this, um, is, it, is that a foot or is it still? No, it's a foot, yeah, good. It's just a kind of small foot. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. It can be a... Um, Check other doors. Got it? Awesome. So here's the story. Look. Phalanges and metatarsals. Really simple. You see this fly? The ones that I'm holding with my fingers. Starting at this one. Those are metatarsals. They form kind of closer to the ball of the foot, part of your sole. One, two, three, four, five. Starting from, from a big toe. Same is true for phalanges. Okay, two phalanges for uh, big toe, three for each and every other uh, toe. Same enumeration starting from the toe, one, two, three, four, five. Proximal, medial, distal. Proximal, medial, distal. Distal. Okay. Now, let's do tarsals. So first, look at these two big bones here. The biggest one is calcaneal bone or calcaneus. Here it is. Okay, this one, it's the heel bone. Second biggest, kind of on top of Calcaneus right here, is Taos. You can kind of see Taos here. We have five more bones to describe. Now, if you look here, this is our memorizer. So this is calcaneus. This next to calcaneus is cuboidal bone. It's basically a lateral bone closer to the four, fifth and fourth metatarsals. How I memorize? Cuboidal starts with C, oh, sorry, calcaneus starts with C, cuboidal starts with C. We're good? Here, you see talus? The bone next to it is called navicular. So TN, Tennessee. It's the absolutely idiotic mnemonic rule. But if you look at these four bones, C, C, Tennessee, TN. Okay? Cuboidal, uh, calcaneus, cuboidal, talus, navicular, C, C, Tennessee. Last three bones that are shaped a bit like a plow. These three. This, this, and this. Those are cuneiform. Okay. Cuneiform means wedge shaped. So look, this cuneiform bone, which is right under the um, big toe, is called medial cuneiform. Next is intermediate cuneiform. And lastly, this one is the lateral cuneiform. So you would look at the foot. We'll try to re kind of show it on the actual foot. So we've got calcaneal bone. We've got talus. 
Urcanius articulates with the cuboidal. Valtalus articulates with the navicular. And then here you have medial uniform. We have medial cuneiform right under the first metatarsal, intermediate cuneiform, and a lateral cuneiform. Now I'm going to check. I, I might have some uh, sort of review videos. On the skeleton, in addition to that, I need to check my old playlists. Okay, but that basically concludes the view of the bones. I want to reiterate one more time those photographs that you have in the study guide. And I think I have those photographs just like as a separate set, unlabeled photographs. Check them out in the study guides. I have a whole bunch of materials. Those would be the ones that you will see. <clears throat> Any questions? If not, let's take a 15 minute break. Be back and we'll talk about joints. And let's start with the classification of the joints. Joints can be classified using um, several approaches. First, let's define a joint, okay? That's gonna be easy. Joint or articulation is any place look, where bones come together. For instance, elbow is a joint. Does that make sense? The, this part, sternum, and a rib. Okay, that's a joint. Um, a tooth and the jaw is a joint. Cranial bones coming together, that's the joint. So, joints can be classified first based on the ability of a functional classification. Uh, seen our floating joints are immovable. For instance, sutures here, joints between the bones of the skull. Are immovable joints. Amphiarthrotic joints are slightly movable. For instance, synthesis the joint between the, the coxal bones, cubic synthesis, or synthesis that are formed between the thoracic vertebrae are slightly movable joints. And those can be classified as unfair And finally, diatroidic joints are freely movable. Um, elbow, shoulder, hip, you know, anything like that. So far, we're good. Right. Right. Oh. Anatomical uh, classification. Joints can be first fibers. Okay, so fibers joints. 
and divided into three categories. Features, always immovable joints, joints between the bones of the skull. That's that's a good one. Symbiosis. Symbiosis. Uh, example of symbiosis will be a joint. I'm going to get Benjamin again. So we can't see it on the skeleton, but radius and ulna are connected by interosseous membranes here. Now look at these two bones. You see they can move against each other. So for instance, distant radio ulna joint, it is slightly movable, not freely, slightly movable. So that's an example of syndesmosis, so it can be unfair to And gumphosis, that's the very specific category of joints. Gumphosis is the joint between your tooth and your jaw. You know, maxilla mandible doesn't matter. The teeth are held in between the alveolar processes by so called periodontal ligament, connective tissue. This is why it's considered a fibrous joint. Next group of joints is cartilaginous joint. And inside of the cartilaginous joint, there are two subtypes simple process. which are best exemplified by the joints between the ribs and the sternum. And synthesis. Synthesis are formed not by hyaline, by the fibrocartilage. cartilage. So for instance, all joints between all the vertebrae here are synthesis, the joint, I can't really, joint cubic synthesis is another example of such a joint. Okay, we good? All right, finally the third Joint type is synovial joint. There are not really any specific subtypes. Well, kind of a cool chat. And synovial joints are the only freely movable joints in the human body. So we're talking about shoulders, hips, elbows, uh, interphalangeal joints. To form and to form joints and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Let's take a look. What are the main components of the synovial joint? We're just going to draw it for you and pull it over. So these are bones. <coughs> Here is going to be really a synovial joint. Okay, so that is a bone. Now, on the joint, the uh, joint is surrounded by the joint capsule. So that's going to be joint capsule. Also called articular capsule. And it is usually composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay? The ends. Of the bones in the joint are covered with the hyaline cartilage. Now they are covered, obviously, it's really hard for me to match the lines, you know. So that stuff here is covered with articular cartilage. It is basically a layer 
It would be hyaline part. Why clear? Just the hyaline part. We call it articular because it covers articular bones. Synovial membrane. Produces synovial fluid that fills synovial pattern. I'm going to use that. That's the only time I'm using this orange thing. So this orange thing paint is synovial fluid. Okay. And it fills the synovial cavity. This whole thing here is a synovial cavity. Uh, sometimes some genes have ligaments. Ligaments can be can be a part of the capsule. Okay, so that's capsular ligament. They can go outside of the capsule. I'm not going to draw it. It's going to be extra capsule ligament, or they can be within the capsule, which makes it intracapsular ligament. Are you following me so far? There are a few other structures that I will list separately. They may or may not be present in a given synovial joint. Those structures are a uh, uh, fat pad. It just a pad which protects the joint from mechanical stress. Versa. Now versa is really hard to explain uh, using no props. Really, uh, are you familiar with the concept, engineering concept of theory? B e a r i n g. No? Fine. Imagine this. Imagine that you have a, a bladder, like a bubble, filled with a synovial fluid. Does that make sense? So this bubble is bubble. I, I, I don't like, imagine a bowl that is between this table, this table that I have in front of me and some kind of a ligament that goes above the tape. So when ligament moves, or if it's a tendon, tendon moves, that ball rolls back and forth, and it prevents ligament from scratching against the table. Replace table with a bone, you're going to get a concept of bursa. So bursa is that bladder with synovial fluid, which is stuck between the tendon or ligament and the bone, and it basically prevents ligament or tendon from rubbing against the bone it makes movement smooth and it kind of rolls does that make sense and then there's tendon sheath which is essentially is a gigantic person like extended around the tendon so, for instance, uh, tendon of the biceps brachii muscle here in the shoulder is wrapped in the tendon sheath, so this tendon does not scrape against the humerus. Okay, that makes sense so far. Some of those I will demonstrate. I will talk about certain individual joints briefly. Now, a few things that I want to mention first: uh, synovial joints being freely movable. They have a certain number of axes, okay? They have axial movement or non-axial movement. <coughs> so there are six classes of synovial joints. Gliding joint, okay? Lighting joints are considered to be non axial. Okay. 
gliding joints, for instance, are between your stars, uh, carbons. Make sense? That's blood. Chain joints, one axis. Elbow, zigzag. Bone socket. Many axes. Two classic examples shoulders and hips. Okay, those are bone and socket. Pivot joint. One axis. So, a good example of pivot joint will be this. Between first and second vertebrae. Right? Okay. One door, two axis, saddle, two axis. So, saddle joint, base of the thumb on the first metacarpal. Okay. Condylar joints are interphalangeal joints, joints between the phalanges. So far, we good. So I'm going to talk about some joint moves. I won't be able to show any moves on my legs, but I will try to project them in my arms. So, uh, general moves are categorized based on the plane. Those moves are produced in um, very specifically sagittal and transverse plane. That's one. Coronal, that's the second story. Okay, so we're going to start with the sagittal and transverse. And we're going to start with our arms, okay? So movement of our arms in the sagittal plane like this, with the angle between the vertical line and the arm decreases, this is flexion. This is flexion also. So this is extension. This is hyper extension. This is extension. Same can be applied to the hand. Flexion, extension, hyper extension. Okay? Does that make sense? What about transverse plane? Same idea. Angle decreases, flexion, extension, hyper extension. Good? From flexion, extension, hyper extension. The only kind of weird trunk move, not the weird, it's just terminology. This and this is called lateral flexion. Okay. Now, a few more moves while we are at the you know, kind of upper body. Uh, rotation and or rotation of the trunk. You good? Now, moves of the arms in the coronal plane. When arms are removed away from the body, basically like, you know, kidnap something, like you take away something, they are abducted. So that movement is abduction. When you bring them back, that's adduction. Abduction, adduction. Does that make sense? This term can be applied to even smaller movements. You look at the uh, palm, this is abduction of the pollux or thumb. This is abduction of the pollux or thumb. Okay, abduction of the pinky, abduction of the Okay, we good? Now, um, 
obviously I, I can't do, um, I can't show legs because I can, you can see it, but the camera can't. I'm, um, I'm trying to see if I have a stepper. Oh yeah, thank you. So maybe I will be able to show at least some of the movements in the So let's see. I'm risking to injure myself, seriously injure myself. So, if we're talking about hips, uh, pay attention only to the hip joint. That's flexion because the angle decreases, and that's extension. And that is hyperextension. Okay? In terms of the knee, extension, flexion. Extension, flexion. We good? Coronal, uh, uh, yeah, coronal plane. Abduction, abduction. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the area of rear knees. One rear knee. Applied, can be applied both to the arm and to the leg. I'm going to show it with an arm. You see how my um, shoulder is basically the same point, but my fist circles. This is not a rotation. This is called circumduction. I make a circle. See that? Ro you, can you rotate the shoulder? The answer is yes. You can rotate the shoulder. See the difference? One axis. Okay. That's one. Funny. Another one, specifically. And, uh, hold a bowl of soup. That's supination, formation. Supination, formation. Uh, while I'm at the upper body, elevation, depression. Now, I'm going to do, well, this I'm not going to do. I'm going to tell you because I have a mask on. When you open your mouth and the jaw goes down, that's depression. When you close your mouth and the jaw goes up, that's elevation. Now, protraction and retraction. Look. When you're moving your mandible forward, you protract mandible. When you move it back, you retract mandible. Does that make sense? Each of these movements is called opposition of the thumb. Now look at my look at my hand and imagine that this is not a hand but a foot. Okay? So that's the sole, that's the heel, those are toes. When I flex my foot like this. Like I stand on my uh, heels, this is called dorsiflexion. When I stand on, stand on my toes, this is called plantar flexion. When I do this, diversion, inversion. Okay? Um, yeah, that's all moves. On anatomy exam, you will have to identify the move based on the picture. The physiology exam, you will have to identify the move based on the description. Like, if I, um, like if I raise my hands, well, it's not, I can raise them well, gazillion ways. Okay, if I do a movement like in uh, that, you know, that Ohio thing, you know, like when I raise my hand to do this, during the during the jumping jacks, what do I do? I do abduction and abduction of both arms and legs. Does that make sense? Kind of that. So, individual joints. Um, anatomically, I want to focus on uh, 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 yeah four. So we're gonna start with the shoulder. Second less stable joint in the human body, 
or amazingly dislocated, the reason for it, oh, I forgot to say, how your joints are stabilized. We forgot that. That's important. So stabilizing factors for the joints. What can we move on about? So stabilizing factors, otherwise it won't understand. From most important to least important. Most important are muscle tendons. Then ligaments. And then articular surfaces. So let me decide on this. Why shoulder joint is not particularly stable? Look. Look at glenoid cavity in the head of the tumors. There's not much to kind of get stuck with. You see, not really. Glenoid cavity, quite frankly, does not provide a lot of fixation. See that? Glenoid cavity does not provide a lot of fixation. So, particular surfaces are basically controlling the work. Ligaments. Well, ligaments here, ligaments that connect uh, humerus and glenoid cavity, this glenohumeral ligament. It looks very promising, but in fact, <coughs> different folks can be formed to different degrees. Sometimes it's more stronger, weaker, so it's not really reliable, stabilizing factor. So the most important factor that stabilizes your shoulder joints are tendons of the muscles that cross it. And that's rotator cuff, biceps, triceps, um, coracobrachialis. Now, those muscles are not particularly huge, okay? Rotoid muscle, they're not particularly huge. So they do provide some degree of stability, but still your shoulder joint is kind of unstable. Does that make sense? Um, dislocations are pretty, pretty common. Next is elbow. Elbow is the hinge joint, and there is a good deal of stability because of Cochlear notch contracting the stroke. You see how like it's well fitted, so that will play a pretty big role. Ligaments wise, there is a decent number of ligaments here. Okay, um, two most, and they are very intertwined. Two most notable ligaments here are. Um, ulnar collateral ligament that basically connects ulna and the humerus, and radial collateral ligament that connects radius and the humerus. And then there are muscles. Right? Again, triceps, biceps, uh, brachialis, brachioradialis, some really, really strong muscles. Okay, and, I mean, still not massive, but they stabilize your own elbow. And the fact that it's uniaxial also helps. Not very much. Too much good. Uh, temporal and jugular joint <coughs> is the least stable joint in the human body. Very easily dislocated. Okay. Um, there are actually two joints, a huge joint. That allows you to open and close the mouth. And the gliding joint that allows you to grind the food by moving the jaw forward, backward, back and back. Does that make sense? Hip joint, another ball and socket, much more stable than, than a shoulder joint. I had it somewhere. Um, my point is 
in the heat joint, there are a few factors that make it particularly stable. First, it's pretty good fit between the head of the femur and the acetabulum. Second, there is a ridge of the cartilage called acetabular labrum that includes that feet. Plenty of ligaments, lubofemoral, ischiofemoral, iliofemoral ligaments that stabilize the joints pretty well. And last but not least, think about all the massive muscles across the hip joint. Your hamstrings, your quadriceps, your um, gluteus muscle, your buttocks muscle. Okay, they provide a lot of, they give a lot of stabilization to the hip joint. So, uh, dislocation of hips is relatively rare. Okay, it brings us to perhaps the most complicated joint in the human body, which is the knee joint. Okay. So patellar tendon and patellar ligament house patella the kneecap. And essentially there are three joints in this um, in the knee. One is patella femoral here. And there are two femoratibial joints. The medial femoratibial tibial and lateral femoratibial joint. Okay. So what about articular surfaces? Well, if you look at this, not much of the stability here, not much of the feet, but in fact, these structures, you can see them here, these ones. Okay, those are in the side. They somewhat improve the feet. Does that make sense? Now, those are fibrocartilage, and we can share them, and we're going to talk about what happens and how you do it. What about ligaments? Well, you have this patellar ligament, and you have two collateral ligaments that prevent um, hyperextension of the knee. The tibial collateral ligament and fibula collateral ligament. They prevent knee from going like this. This model doesn't really show it because they're made out of rubber, but real ligament would prevent it. That makes sense. On this model, um, there are a couple of posterior ligaments. Um, sorry, brain fog. The gluteal ligament and oblique ligament that um, form kind of a posterior part of the joint capsule. But of course, probably want to hear about the most famous ligament, intracapsular ligament called ACL. So here in this model, this is ACL. It connects the anterior portion of the tibia with the posterior aspect here in the femur. Okay? This is why it's called anterior cruciate ligament. Essentially, if you think of arrangement of two intracapsular ligaments inside of the knee joint, it's going to be ACL that connects front of the tibia to the back of the femur, and PCL that connects back of the tibia with the front of the femur. You see how they cross? This is why they call the cushion crossing. Here, what happens? When somebody, let's say you are playing uh, football, and somebody tackles you from the side into your knee, shoulder into the knee. Make sense? It's a lateral tackle, and your knee goes like that. So first to go will be TCL, T-bill collateral. Does that make sense? When it snaps, knee continues to Extend sideways. And this next thing to snap is ACL. If it goes further, then meniscus can be formed. Does that make sense? It's called 
three C definition. Okay, tibial, collateral, anterior cruciate, and meniscus. Now, uh, can you tear meniscus by itself? Yes. Usually, some sliding movements in the knee. Okay, meniscus can be torn without affecting ACL action. So far, does that make sense to you? So what can we do about those joints? I'm not going to put um, tears and sprains and luxations on the board. So basically, when a ligament is torn or a meniscus is damaged, they heal very poorly because they poorly vascularize. The cartilage is almost impossible. When the meniscus is torn, Surgeon will remove pieces of meniscus, right? Um, but the problem is, every time you have a trauma to meniscus, you lose some parts of it. Then you become less and less stable, and further trauma is more and more likely. So, in people who, like in, in the football player, they will have to play more and more with less and less stable knees, so they're going to get injured more and more, and eventually they will lose meniscus. And that removes the cushioning between the bones. They start to rub against each other, and the person will develop osteoarthritis, which will address in a few minutes. If ACL is torn, then the role of ACL and PCL is to prevent this disposition of the bones, you know, anterior posterior movement. You can basically tell if. It's torn or not. If ACL is torn, for instance, there are a few options. You can um, stitch them back, which is hard because it's regular dense connective tissue. All the fibers go in the same direction. It's not really reliable. You can just reduce it, put the cast, and just leave it. Hopefully, it will grow back. Or you can put a graft. That's good. Okay. Now, what about chronic inflammatory disease to the joint, which is arthritis? There are three arthritis types. First is osteoarthritis. That's the age of the disease. Wear and tear. We work our joints, does that make sense? Damage the cartilage that leads to inflammation. And usually at 80, 85, you start developing osteoarthritis, your joints are swollen and painful. There's nothing really to help. No steroid or anti inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. Moving, walking is really important. Because if you don't move your joints, inflammation, Imagine that you have two joints, two bones, that are losing articular cartilage. So the joint, the bone surfaces are exposed like this. No articular cartilage. Eventually, no articular cartilage. Bones start to rub against each other. They get inflamed. And inflammation, when it is resolved, it is resolved by the formation of connective tissue membrane. Okay? This connective tissue membrane eventually is replaced. It's called ankylosis. And then when connective tissue membrane eventually is replaced by the bone, it's called bony ankylosis. Bones essentially tears. Does that make sense? By moving, you kind of promote inflammation to some extent, but you also prevent ankylosis. So that's osteoarthritis. Not a flavor of it. Is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, that's autoimmune disease. It affects mostly age of 40 to 50. I remember uh, the gender distribution that 40 to 50. Your immune system leads to the inflammation of the joint. Treatment is immunosuppressants, from steroids to very specific antibody drugs, and it's treatable, it's not curable, but it's treatable. 
for people in the community. And finally, third type is gout arthritis or gout. So that's age mechanism is uric acid accumulation in the lungs. This affects mostly men after a certain age. Um, my father who is 83, he has gout arthritis, and he doesn't, so the treatment, again, there's no real treatment treatment, uh, he walks a lot, it affects mostly feet, so he walks a lot too, don't let joints to fuse, problems to feet, and you should avoid alcohol, alcohol makes it really bad, okay? Increases that relation of the Does that make sense? Now, I want to make it clear when we say the word arthritis, we refer just, just to joint information, that's a disease. It's like a cough. Make sense? Like cough, 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 all caused by different reasons, different underlying reasons. I'm saying this because there's a bunch of infectious diseases that can cause arthritis. So, for instance, untreated gonorrhea can eventually progress. One of the sort of uh, complications is arthritis, joint inflammation. Untreated strep throat, one of possible complications is arthritis. Um, some viral infections like chikungunya, which is not in the United States, may lead to arthritis. Does that make sense? So Lyme disease, the most famous one, untreated Lyme disease can lead to arthritis. So it's more of a, a symptom rather than disease per se. Any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, that's it for today and for this unit. We're not gonna start muscles, that's for sure. <laughs>